Good afternoon. Welcome to session two in the first IHS live online symposium. My name is Courtney Gahan and I'm the moderator for today's session. Before we begin, I will outline the translation options. We have French, Spanish and Arabic translation available today. You can only use the translation if you are joining us on Zoom. You can find this at the bottom of your screen on the, under the globe icon. And please note that the Arabic translation is available under the Chinese label. Please remember to mute the original audio if you're using the translation function. The first IHF live online symposium forms part of the virtual academy recently launched by the IHF to facilitate global online learning and licensing opportunities. All of this forms part of the IHF Education Center available at ihfeducation.ihf.info. Today's lecture forms part of 20 lectures presented as part of this symposium by top experts from around the world focused on coaching and refereeing, but of interest to all in handball and all enthusiasts. This lecture this afternoon is from IHF referees, Matt Hansen and Martin Gedding, and focuses on passive play. Please feel free to ask questions throughout the lecture and we, I will pass as many of these on to the referees as possible. And please also note that this video is being recorded and will be available on the IHF Education Center at a later date. And with that, we're ready for you to begin, Matt and Martin. Thank you very much, Courtney. Uh, we will start our presentation. And uh, hello, everyone. Hello. Um, is it running? Yeah, like this. Um, when we got uh, this assignment, we were, of course, very excited because this is a very, um, it's a very interesting area concerning uh, modern handball. And uh, I guess everyone out there watching a handball game knows how hard passive play uh, is and how hard it, it is to decide uh, the correct moment for passive play. What Martin and I today are going to run through is uh, some of the areas which is uh, problematic uh, concerning passive play, especially uh, after the forewarning signal has been shown. And um, we will try to come up with a lot of examples where we We'll explain from our experience how to use it in the in the con correct manner. Okay, um, I will start with uh, some of the areas that um, that we have been focusing on seeing as a challenge uh, because passive play it has actually always been a big challenge for everybody, not only for the referees but also for the teams and the coaches and the spectators to understand. Um, I guess that some of us is uh, old enough to remember that we actually had a game without the forewarning signal. And um, it was it was a si significant decision to change uh, going from direct passive play uh, as the only opportunity um, into where we are today, where we can use the forewarning signal. When we got the signal, we, we, I think everybody hoped that this was the ultimate solution. But uh, honestly, from our side, we can only say that it, it opened up for, uh, for some new problems. And uh, today we will, we, we will tell you why. Um, today, the teams, they are using um, the possibility to have very long attacks uh, because they know that uh, they have six passes after the forewarning signal. And that is the reason why the referees, they have, have the opportunity to, to whistle before six passes. Um, especially when, um, when the teams, they play with uh, one or more player less. And uh, we also see a lot of situations in the end of the games where they try to, to keep a certain result. In this first clip, uh, we will show um, something we have seen throughout the last couple of seasons where one team they keep an attack for more than a minute and uh, we will try to explain why it's not best for, for modern handball. We will run the clip now. Thank you. 
now it's important that everybody is focusing on um, how long time the attacking team is using uh, in, in this very decisive moment. As you can see now, they have actually used more or less 50 seconds before uh, the defending team scored the last goal. The forwarding signal has been shown now. And you can see that the attacker is using tactics to bring down the yellow player. As well, yeah. And once more, one more free throw. Yeah, this is um, from our side, not in the spirit of Hempel. And uh, this is not to bring in a time factor, but it's um, it's more to say that we have several opportunities before the forewarning signal and also after the forewarning signal has been shown that um, that we can uh, we can turn the play. Um, time a time factor is difficult because we should never aim for a time factor. Uh, and now we say that it should be not possible to keep an attack for, for close to 80 seconds. But uh, we, first of all, we need to bring in the forewarning signal much earlier. And uh, second of all, we should have the possibility to whistle before six passes. It should never be allowed. Okay, we go to the next, uh, we go to the next clip. Um, and this is... Uh... Also, one of the challenges that we have, uh, the, the attacking team that try to make an open space on the passive play, and the defending team makes a usual, uh, a normal uh, uh, defense without any chance to give the pun for the referees to give them a punishment. So here, I think uh, we have a normal um, game going on. As you can see, a normal build-up phase, even though it's not that fast, but okay, this is what's going on in handball. And there you can see after 40 seconds, passive play. And the attacking team is trying to get an open chance. But what we also want to show in this clip is that now it's going to get problematic for the referees because now we will have free throw and free throw and free throw. And this is definitely not easy. And you can also see the tints of the uh, defenders is growing. That means we have free throw all the time.
in our opinion, it's not possible to risk before the six passes, and they have six passes in this attack. Um, but it's a long time both for the team, but also for referees, but also for the spectators to look at an uh, attack like this. If we have any chance uh, in this clip, we don't, we don't feel that we have the chance to turn the play, but if we have any chance, we should definitely do it. All right, um, the next one. Um, in general, the referees, they have a lot of tasks in, in the last minute of the game. And one of them is, of course, to keep an eye on passive behavior. Um, we see a lot of situations where one team is trying to, to let the time run as much as possible without searching for a real chance to score a goal. Um, yeah, we run the video, video once again. We think that it's it would be nice if you focus once again on the on the goal scoring uh, and of course you focus on the time because um, in this case uh, the attacking team they are actually managed to to play for the last minute and, and you uh, also mentioned that the one man that the uh, player suspended yeah they play one player less yeah exactly and now this is after team timeout And if you look at the scoring, they are actually at the moment having the result they want to have. And you can see the yellow player number two who just continued to, to walk in the, in the area uh, instead of taking a quick throw off. Yeah, and now a timeout right before the end of the game. Um, yeah, this is actually a brilliant example of um, the most professional teams. They are absolutely using this as a tactic. And in our opinion, it, it should not be possible to, um, to win a game like this when you uh, you more or less play not active for the last 70 80 seconds um we think that it's quite obvious that the only thing uh, the attacking team want is to take um to take seconds off the clock uh without a chance to to lose the ball um and um yeah i think do you have anything to add yeah, Martin? yes uh, they should take the referees should take care, uh, a lot of care of uh, by raising the forward and a signal with, uh, in the last 15 seconds because the good team, they can, without any problem, reach, uh, cannot reach uh, six passes before uh, these 15 seconds. So take very much uh, care about raising the hand too late in the game. Yeah, and we will have examples showing this uh, later in our presentation. All right, we uh, run for the next one. Um, uh, in this situation, we will more or less continue in, this, in the same line, yeah. Here we see the force are nine seconds before the end of the game, and that's even more critical than we saw in the last clip. As you can see, they had five passes in these nine seconds and they could easily have spent more time on that. So uh, this is our message for the last 15 seconds. Don't raise the hand there. Yeah, it's, it's, hard, to, uh, it's hard to come up with a time uh, limit, right? Yeah. But, but uh, on the other hand, in our opinion, if you, um, um, if you 
if you have the possibility, it, it, it would definitely be much, much better not to raise the arm with 15 seconds uh, to go up the game. So we, Martin and I, we always had an internal rule about this, that, that we would never raise the hand within the last 15 to 20 seconds. Also because when we have the forerunning signal, it both make pressure on us, but also make pressure on the teams. So we think we should decide earlier uh, because now we can communicate uh, throughout the, the headset. So make it a, a clear tactic or deal when we are going to raise a hand in, in every last minute. Uh, yeah, it makes no sense in the, in the absolute end of the game. Uh, all right, we go to uh, the next one. I don't know if we have any questions so far, Courtney. Uh, we don't have any questions yet, but I guess there's one gap. I'm, I don't know if you're going to address this later, but um, you spoke about not raising the hand towards the end. How does that have a positive impact on the end of the game if you avoid this? Can't the team just do the same thing? Yeah, but honestly, the problem is that um, I think we, we saw in, in some of the, uh, the former clips that... Um, the teams, the defending team, they are always uh, arguing about us to raise the arm, of course, because they want to have the possession of the ball. Um, and I think that's the reason why sometimes we, we raise the hand with 15 or 10 seconds left, actually, because we are under pressure. But in our opinion, it, it definitely makes no sense. So you should do it, you should do it before, because otherwise, as we showed in the last clip with the Rheinnecker Löwen, you can easily have 15 seconds to go, even without having a free throw or without trying to shoot uh, at the goal. Um, I guess the best teams, they are experts in doing this. Um, so I, I hope that's, uh, that's the answer yeah, to your question. But also, if you look when the referees have their forewarning signal, it's not natural for the referees. It's, you can also see that the teams they are attacking more aggressively, even though that it's uh, because if 10 seconds left and we have a passive sign, then it's more even more aggressive than it is without uh, a passive sign. Yeah, definitely. so that's a little bit of a spirit of that. Um, someone has just asked, but I think you're going to address this if they can declare passive play before six passes. But I think you're going to talk a bit more about this. Yeah, but absolutely, and uh, and of course we will come up with some examples where where this is applied, uh, because of course there's several um, situations there where this would be suitable for the game. Yeah, we will both bring examples where we are where we could uh, uh, whistle without uh, for one signal, but also where we're referring uh, we could call the passive play before the six passes under four running signal. And I would say what we have addressed until now is also to show a bit about the tactics from the team side. Uh, because uh, honestly, we also have to be uh, aware that sometimes the teams, they are using this as a tactical weapon. Because they know that in most cases, they, can, they have six passes. So uh, it's very important that we also show them that sometimes they don't have six passes. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the challenging uh, thing about uh, the passive rule. And Bjarne uh, Mung Jensen tomorrow he'll speak a lot more about the general passive play and soon we'll go into this what the real theme is today that uh, this is the passive play before six passes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's all for now. So. <laughs> okay. We will uh, go further. Um, in this uh, clip, uh, the topic is uh, the timing of the forewarning signal because the timing is also very important, um, mainly. <laughs> mainly because uh, otherwise it's impossible for the teams to know when they have made the first pass. And honestly, it's also a problem uh, for the spectators to know that uh, now the referees, they raise their arm, but have the team used zero or have they used one pass? So the timing is very important as well. Uh, the clip is here.
what we think was the, the problem in this clip was that the, um, the forewarning signal uh, came from the referees a few seconds uh, after they had a free throw where they had a really good chance to score a goal. And this is uh, when you have a shot on goal and the goalkeeper is, has saved it, it's not a good time to raise the hand just in, in a few seconds after that because they, they try to score a goal and that's not passive play. Yeah, but actually it's also not to punish the teams, right? Yeah. Because they when they when they try to to go for a goal, we should definitely not punishing them by showing the forewarning signal. Um, and in this case, uh, it could have been earlier or it could also have been later. Yeah, um, but, but yeah. that you have to look for, for the whole out attack. But yeah. to raise the hand just after a nine meter where the shot and goal is the, not the right time. And uh, just to finish it, uh, <laughs> the call from the referees in this, in this case was was actually after eight passes. Yeah, but it was not the main topic. No, it was not the main topic. But but yeah, it, okay. We will uh, we will go further. Um, yeah, and here we have an easy example of direct passive play without forward signal. And now we go into this part. The next clips we have where we are uh, it where we are discussing about direct passive play without forward signal. Yeah, it's the first one. It's coming here. And I think it's obvious for everyone that this, the white player, he had a clear chance of scoring, but instead of taking the last jump to, uh, to score the goal, he just played the ball backwards and that's Clear for everyone, this must be passive play immediately without forewarning signal and anything else. And uh, from our uh, opinion, actually, there is quite a lot of situations where you could do this. Yeah. Uh, but um, I can say from the referee's side, we are all we are always very um, afraid about this decision because okay, now that this game is decided, but it's not an easy decision to take. And the reason why it makes uh, a lot of noise from everybody is that uh, they don't see it that often. And that's the reason why nobody understands when we're doing it. In this case, I think we can say that it's very obvious. Yeah, but we'll see some clips where, where we both call can call a passive play and we should not call. And the difference is not that big. Exactly. And these very in crucial moments in these matches. Yeah. OK, we take one step further. Um, uh, in this case, it's uh, it's very clear that um, the attacking player definitely not wants to score a goal, uh, even though there's free space in front of him. Um, it's quite simple that uh, it must be a free throw for the defending team without showing the forewarning signal for passive play. But we will run the clip. Uh, Maybe the video is not here. Yeah, no, 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 no. Okay, it's coming now. It's here. Yeah. All right. This uh, this is actually a quite famous clip from Denmark because it, it made a lot of uh, noise afterwards. Um, because actually, uh, what we're also trying to explain here is that this was due to relegation. Um, and even though there is a four goal difference, um, the one t the the team behind they only needed to uh, to lose by three goals, right? No, no, right? it was okay to win, for them to lose yeah. by four goals. That's right. Yeah. And that was the reason why this uh, made a lot of um, <laughs> noise in the press afterwards. But now you will see it. One moment. Um, I think we should maybe explain what's happening uh, because um, 
the attacking team, uh, the home team, they are uh, passing the ball to each other and um, the, def the defending team, they are of course making a very aggressive attack uh, to try to get the ball. And uh, in this case, the referee, he decides after how many passes? Eight, uh, I don't know, yeah, no. after, after eight seconds. Yeah, after eight seconds, he decides to have a direct passive play. Um, and then the goalkeeper, he uh, he catches the ball and then he throws it away. And that's uh, due to the uh, due to the last 30 seconds. Uh, he is punished by a red card and the red card leads to a seven meter. Uh, and the seven meter in this case makes um, leads to a, or, or leads to a, a goal scoring. And in this case, the, the the home team are relegated after this. And that was the reason why there was so much fuss about uh, this situation. Um, but our conclusion is, I think it's, of course, it's difficult, but yeah, yeah, uh, we, will you conclude, Martin? Yeah, uh, we we think it's not a decision. Uh, it's not a situation where we can call the direct passive play because you can, as you could, could see on the on the clip, they started uh, the free throw on their own nine meter line. And then they played up to uh, about one or two meters before the middle. So in fact, they were playing uh, forward. I can run it again. Yeah, I and then I can know. speak again. Yeah. I think you, you can, can see, run, run through the clip. Yeah, they start with the ball at, the, at their own uh, free throw line. And then they're going forwards with two passes. And then they're go he's going forward again. And this is OK. OK, then he's playing backward. There, uh, when the referee called the dark passive play, you could have decided a uh, forewarning signal but not in this game because, as you can see, there's only a few seconds left. And if you remember what we said in the last clip, that we should not raise the hand with such a few seconds. So in our opinion, uh, we should not uh, let it uh, go as a direct passive play because he uh, he really searched for the way to go uh, forward in the first. No, and honestly, we also have to take very much care about uh, the defending team because when the defense is changing, uh, the attacking team, they also have to change uh, the tactics. And uh, when you have um, when you have a defending team defending one against one, it's quite obvious that uh, the attacking team they want to use the whole court uh, because otherwise it's more or less impossible for them to uh, to to go through. So uh, in our opinion, this is uh, definitely not a time for direct passive play. No, and uh, also be because the rules are the same, even though there's a full court pressure or it's uh, pl uh, playing six against six in normal way. Yeah, and um, the playing rules are also the same throughout the game, right? Yeah. Uh, we also have to be aware of that, yeah. that we shouldn't change in the last minute. And it's... the main point is that uh, the, the green team is bringing the ball forward in the most of the time in this clip. Yeah, exactly. Exact. Uh, yeah, and as Martin concluded before, if there was much much more time left, uh, the referees, they could use the forewarning signal instead, uh, but never a direct passive play. Uh, Courtney, did it lead to any questions or are we just running? No, we have some questions. Um, okay. So you speak about the this pressure in the final seconds and someone has asked about this as a referee if it's a very close game, there is there can be pressure and related to passive play, especially um, in like the last 20 seconds. How do you deal with this as the referee? But honestly, as as I said before, uh, we, we have to deal with it the same way as we deal with it uh, the first uh, 59 minutes. And uh, and I think everybody who has been in uh, in a handball arena knows that the pressure is rising, of course, within the last minute, uh, especially if the score is equal. But we uh, we made always uh, a deal uh, in the last minute, or not in last when we uh, we reached the time uh, 29 15 in, in each half. Then we have a deal. Do we have a passive play or forewarning signal if we go to the end, or do we not? Yeah. Exactly. We, we try to make an agreement within our, our teamwork, uh, how we handle the last minute. And, uh, and, and a lot of players, they also, uh, they ask us when the, when the passive play sign will be shown. 
and uh, of course in we, we will never we will we will never tell about that because it will it will make our life much more much more <laughs> difficult yeah um yeah i think it's just that uh for you it's normal to know that you apply the rules the same but i'm noticing that this is a theme that a lot of people are asking about that some people who maybe referee at a lower level feel different pressure and they find it difficult to manage this at different stages of the game. So uh, this yeah. is just interesting. Yeah, but I, I, I really understand why, uh, why we have this question because to say that we are not under pressure just because we have, we have refereed a lot of games, and that, would, <laughs> yeah, that would definitely not be true because we are as much as under pressure as, as every, uh, every referee around the world. But I think that it's it's very important that you that you are uh, very strong in your teamwork, and you, as Martin said before, you really have to make some decisions about what you are going to do and what you are not going to do. Like like the teams have a tactic for the last minute, mm -hmm. every last minute. Uh, we also made a uh, tactic, and that's not the same tactic for every match, but it's a tactic for this match that we are through in. Yeah, and I would also say that uh, now we saw this situation with the red card within the last 30 seconds. And I know today we're talking mainly or only about passive play, but it's very, very important that we, you are aware that everything can be decided within the last minute. So uh, I, I would not say that you should not be concentrated in the first 59 minutes, but everybody knows that uh, that the last minutes is it's very decisive also concerning passive play. And can you talk a bit about progressive punishment for an attacking team if they are leading and it's close and in the and there's a passive play situation? How how does the progressive punishment come into play? For for the attacking team? Yes. The, the attack team cannot have a progressive uh, punishment for uh, passive play. It's only a, you, you can. Uh, it's not. Uh, Possible according to the rules. Courtney, are you are, are you asking about a, a possibility to punish passive play? Yes, this is what someone is asking. Okay, okay, like okay, if, okay, if okay, one team it, is winning and it's clear they are using a tactic, like almost like what you just maybe what you just showed, or yeah. um, so what punishments are applied in this? Situation? Okay, but it's it's very it's nice to have uh, questions like this because it's very easy to answer. It's not possible. No, they, we could just award a free throw for the defending team. That's yeah. the only possibility we have. So in these moments, the people need to remember the last thirty seconds of the game rule more. This is very applicable. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And 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 uh, uh, on the other hand, you can also have uh, you can have thirty uh, times passive play against you. Yeah, uh, and then in the last thirty seconds, you should be very aware uh, when the attacking team are losing the ball that they're not bringing the ball with them because then we are in something in different. And then we're speaking a last thirty seconds rule and you know red card and and uh, uh, seven, seven meter, meter yeah. if. If they bring the ball away, yeah, like actually, like you saw in the last clip, because the goalkeeper, the ball was out of play, and the yeah. goalkeeper he throwed it away. Uh, that was the reason why it it led to a to a red card. Yeah, to a red card yeah. on the second meter. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. We, we go. go. We go. On. Mm -hmm. We go through. Um, actually, here we have a situation that could be similar to the previous clip we just showed, uh, but with uh, some significant changes in in the details. Maybe we should uh, we should run it again. And Martin, will you yeah, talk yeah, uh, talk it through? Yeah, as yes, well. Uh, one moment. Yeah. If you compare this clip with this previous clip that we saw, we can see here that the red team uh, they have a throw off at the middle, and here the the player is going back. And here he also is going back. So here, 
the red team they brought the they brought the ball from the middle line onto the own nine meter line and that's completely different it's opposite than the, what we saw in the other clip so here we think it's uh, a good uh, um, sign to to a uh, decision to make the uh, the passive play direct so uh, what our yeah, task to see is that in the first clip we saw that they brought the uh, ball forward and here they bring it uh, backward and that's the reason why we think there is there's a difference in the decision uh, and in in this case it's definitely once again used tactically yeah because, uh, because they know that uh, they can easily they can with seven or eight seconds to go yeah. they can easily do whatever they want without having passive play against them yeah. and that's the reason why sometimes the referees they have to be a bit more clever yeah uh all right we go for the next one um here we have uh, an example where um, we guess that some could yeah. whistle for passive some play. Yeah, Martin, will you conclude yeah. on this? Clip? And you, uh, as you can see, uh, uh, in the beginning, they they brought the, the ball forwards, and then in the last two, three seconds, they took it back again. So here, uh, it's like uh, the first clip that we could raise the hand for the foreman signal, but it doesn't make any sense when you only have two seconds left. And in, in total, I think it was six or seven seconds. So in our opinion, it should not be a... Uh, passive direct passive play here and once again we can say that um, the attacking team is very much under pressure yeah, because uh, the defending team they go one against one yeah but they try to uh, to find uh, some spaces and so on they're not going backwards yeah um here we will show an example of um, but maybe should yeah point out that now we have we're turning to a new chapter because now we have uh, uh, some clips without forewarning signal. And the next clip will all be with where we have some forewarning signal. And there we can, we can discuss whether it should be called a passive play before six passes. Yes, exactly. Yeah, we have tried to define some of the problematic areas um concerning this and uh, of course the first one is the right time to show the forewarning signal uh, and of course team tactics we have been uh, we very much uh, into this area but uh, in our opinion the team tactics they, they have changed they are getting more and more clever in the way of of handling um uh, the way they they treat the ball and the the way they make the uh, the game looks very fast without uh, the ball is moving actually uh, of course the score um and any changes under the forewarning signal signal as well um in this clip we will see a very slowly build up phase um yeah And you can see it's very slowly. Yeah. Actually, extremely slowly. <laughs> yeah. I hope everybody is still awake. <laughs> so now we have played 30 seconds and they haven't touched anything yet. Yeah, and how many passes now, Martin, after uh, the 4-1? Uh, I think he had two, because I think it's the end of the three. I'm not sure. 
Yeah, uh, he could be two passes after the four yeah, running yeah, circle. Now it's three, and yeah. now he's bouncing. Uh, yeah, I I think we don't uh, we don't need to uh, to run it again. But um, as Martin said before, the green team is actually using thirty seconds for the first build up phase, and for, in, for doing nothing. For doing nothing. And in my opinion, when I see the clip again, I've seen it several times. But when I see it again. I think we should be even more fast with the forewarning signal. Yeah, but that was not the main point. No, nope. it's not the main point, but uh, we should be more aware about uh, the passive behavior. Um, and after the first seconds, the forewarning signal is shown, of course, and uh, they get a free throw. And um, then the playmaker bounces the ball several times without moving forwards, uh, because the only thing he wants is to, to take even more time of the clock and of course, try to to find a teammate which can come in a good position. And um, and in this case, we don't need to wait for the seven seven pass to to whistle for the passive play. So, in our opinion, this is uh, not even, not because it's our own clip, but yeah. uh, it's a school example about uh, how the teams they are using this tactic, and they actually think they can only wait for six passes. Yeah. Uh, and in this case, they couldn't wait. But I think he was more happy because he could use maybe 10 seconds more in yeah. the bill of faith that he has should have used. And uh, honestly, this is uh, the, one of the key factors in our presentation is that uh, it's easy to referee or to whistle before six passes. Because the good players, they know, you can see he just dropped the ball because he knew that it was not a good attack from his team. Yeah. Um, this uh, in this case we have an example where it's possible to definitely possible to whistle passive play before six passes. Will you talk it through, Martin, or yeah. uh, maybe it would be good? And now we have very soon we have the the four uh, one signal. signal, yes. And we have a free throw. And now we have the moment, right? Yeah, because we dropped the ball after the first uh, try to make a chance on the forward signal. And we can say this was after three or four passes. Yeah, something like that, yeah. And of course, now it ends up okay. quite easy because it ends up in a, in a goal, Brilliant. but it could end up in a situation where it was a free throw over and over yeah. and over again. Because after the forward signal, they make a pressure played backwards and then he dropped the ball and then in our opinion it should be a, a free throw uh, for the defending team exact um uh, one back but we can conclude that the forewarning signal was on the right time on the right time exactly because they tried to build up uh, the defense was good and then they ran out of uh, possibilities and then they raised their hand in a very good way. Yeah, and that's also the reason why it's very, very important that we all that the defense also benefit from doing a good job. Yeah. And in this case, they are actually not benefit from it because it ends up with a goal against them. Um, guys, we have some questions. Uh, and someone was asking about when I, I think just some clearer understanding of when to show the forewarning signal. So maybe you can tell us a bit about your criteria, what you choose, if you can, if it's possible to define this. It's very difficult, but uh, we'll try to make it as clear as we can, because in every attack, um, we always let the team to have a bit of face. And it should be quicker than in the green team. We saw some clips ago, but uh, it's also very that they should have uh, at least uh, two possibilities. If they go direct uh, to make a fast uh, build up face, 
and the first one is uh, is not good, and then it should have a second. And then if the missed the second opportunity to make a build of face where they could score a goal from somewhere else, it's okay. But then uh, we think we should, after the second possibility, we should uh, raise the hand in a normal way. And then you could have some on normal situations like the one we had before, where you can raise the hand after 20 seconds because they haven't tried to build up um, mm -hmm. anything good. And and we also uh, try to keep focus um, when they when they the teams they change their behavior. Yeah. First of all, when they suddenly do a strange uh, substitutions. Yeah. Um, if they suddenly, when they play with one or two player less, they are changing the tactics about how they play. It, we always have a rule in by ourselves that uh, if the team is uh, attacking team is one man less, you can always see that the, the the players are running around, but the ball is not moving more than three meters uh, uh, from one side to another. I think that uh, Bjarne is definitely going to show that tomorrow, uh, where the the players are running around, but the ball is not moving. And uh, it, it more or less looks looks like a, an an exercise they do uh, for the warm up, yeah, right? Yeah. And uh, and and they just they just go into this phase uh, automatically when they play with one player less. And in that case, we have to be very aware that now they are changing the tactics. Mm -hmm. um, some people have also asked about just talking about you talked a bit about the possibilities and that you see in the attack and uh, someone, some people have asked about if there is a clear shooting chance, especially in the last seconds and the player decides to pass the ball. Uh, would you say this is direct passive play? Yeah. Uh, and we also, we had one example uh, earlier in the presentation where we went for direct passive play and uh, this is, a very good it's a good question but it's also a good situation for direct passive play yeah. when you have a clear chance of scoring and you you don't go for the clear chance of scoring in that case you have to turn the play immediately immediately without any forewarning signal just direct passive play it's yeah. a school example about when you have to do it mm -hmm. okay hmm? yes let's go on <laughs> yeah we go on um here we have a situation where the referees, they choose to uh, go for passive play after five passes. Should we run it again just to explain what's happening? Because otherwise it could be quite hard to see if it's five or six passes, but it, it's it, it's actually only five. Yeah, it is. Uh, one, yeah. You can see uh, after the four one signal, they're trying to build up and open. Uh, yeah, to get an opportunity. To score goal. And it will come now. now yeah, yeah, now, yeah. And see, they try to make open space. And there's you drop the ball and playing backwards. And that's the right moment to uh, call for the passive play. Yeah, and, th and in this case, it's actually, it doesn't matter if it's four or five or six no, passes. No. Because uh, it's, it's very natural for the game that uh, the, the ball is going backwards. The player loses the control of the ball and we, uh, we, we go the other way. It's a, it's a perfect, in our opinion, it's a perfect decision. And it doesn't matter if it's three, four, five, or six passes. Yeah. Now it was five. But also uh, to underline that in the beginning of the, of the forward signal, they try to make a good chance. Definitely, definitely. Okay, we go for the next one. Um, and here we have a good example where the referees, they whistle passive play before uh, six passes.
and here we have um, we see we'll see it all in uh, we see, we'll see repeated because we have to look um, about when the rain uh, hand is going to be raised. You can see here the ball isn't there, and the referee just uh, raises the hand. Yeah, as we mentioned before, it's you have to take very much care about when you raise the hand. You have to do it in the right moment when one of the players have the ball yeah. under control. And still, uh, and again, uh, the referee called the passive play uh, because uh, the back player wants to play the ball backward again. I think it's a good decision. Is it this slider one? Uh... Yeah. yeah, because uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, again, we have to focus on the good defense. Yeah, because the the defense is, is doing a really good job in this case, and they are uh, they are actually making the attacking team uh, have no possibilities to come through. Yeah. And then we have to also uh, because we were speaking about when they raised the hand and they did it twenty two seconds before the end of the game. That means it's it's in a good time. Yeah, you still have the you still have the time to have play, a passive play against you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and of course, once again, yeah. focus very much about when the the hand signal is shown. Yeah. Uh, okay, the next clip is uh, a call for passive play after one pass, and that's actually also possible. Uh, now the video size is a bit small, but uh, maybe Martin, you will talk during the video clip uh, like this. So. And, and there the raise the hand. Yeah, um, I, I run it again. I run it again. And you can see here uh, the four one signal. And then the playmaker got the ball again. She starts to bounce and stop moving forward. We think it's a good opportunity because uh, um, she didn't manage to fix the ball. And she, she missed the opportunity to make an uh, and build up face uh, in a very short time. So we think it's a good opportunity to uh, to whistle for the passive play before six passes. And good defense again. Yeah, defense. Yeah. Uh, Courtney, are we get are we getting any uh, comments now? Because I guess this is a maybe a bit controversial. Because I think that everybody would think that uh, it should should at least be three or four passes before we can uh, we can turn the play. I think yes, there there is a general theme that um, some people are not still a bit uncertain when to apply six passes and um, yeah. yeah, of and course. How, yeah, so um, I think. But maybe you're going to help them understand this more as you go. I don't know. Nah, but uh, of course we have already have a lot of we have always uh, already showed a lot of situations. But I think uh, of course it's very hard to con conclude of, on on it. But it's also very. Uh, but we can conclude on a four one signal. We only have one chance to build up a good chance. Yeah, exact, exact. You cannot have two possibilities on a forward signal. I, I know it's a little bit uh, difficult to uh, to conclude, but it's maybe the uh, it could be the general line. Yeah, but one of the general problems about uh, the correct use of the passive play is, of course, it's it's more or less a feeling, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. And uh, and and that's also the reason why maybe it's easier to explain when we are showing the clips, of course, because yeah. if I should tell somebody who, who never watched a handball game about passive play. I would more or less have to uh, to make a not a not a doctor uh, uh, handling, but but more or less use a lot of time to to explain how passive play is working, because as a referee, especially as a referee for for so many years as Martin and I have been doing it, it's more or less like a, it's like a feeling, right? Uh, but I think in in general we can of course come up with some uh, best practice best practices. Um, that some of maybe some of the not so experienced referees watching this can use uh, 
Um, first of all, I would say that it's it's also applied in the playing rules that you have to go for the goal. You, you have to search for the goal. And if you're not searching for the goal, this is definitely passive behavior. Uh, and as Martin mentioned before, uh, you also need to have the chance to build up. Uh, you need to have a certain build up phase. And then I would say, um, concluding on the last clip we showed where, where, where the referees, they had passive play after one pass. Um, I think we have to be very careful about uh, also um, uh, benefiting from a good defense, because sometimes the, a good defense is not, um, they are not awarded to do a, a good defense. And that's the reason why our conclusion on the last clip is that this is also due to a good defense. Mm -hmm. um, someone asked um, about ver just verbally saying, play faster. <laughs> um, I'm just curious about, can you talk about this a bit? Because I, I think this is related to what Ramon always talks about with yellow cards being like a gift and a verbal warning is not actually in the rules, but... Mm -hmm. Um, maybe some people then have not so much confidence to apply the passive play rule if they would prefer to just ask the players. So, yeah, but, um, it, it, yeah, but I, I think we understand your question. Yeah. And, um, and as Ramon is always focusing on, um, uh, it's, it's very important that we are, that we are uh, direct and obvious in what we're doing. And everybody should understand why we're doing things on the court. Mm -hmm. And I would say when it comes to passive play, sometimes we also use the tool to maybe to say to the players that this is going too slowly, right? Yeah. We have no chance to punish. The only punish we have is to raise the arm and, and referee for passive play. But, but sometimes it will make our job easier if we tell the players that now you have, having, you, you have had this behavior for, for the whole game and we will continue showing the forewarning signal. And but it's also uh, a little bit symbolic, symbolic because if you look in the playing rules, uh, passive play is only in, in two lines, not two lines, but in a very short line, but in the clarification, that's much more about passive. And there it's, it says a lot about uh, it could be in, like this, so it brings a lot of possibilities. So passive play is a very uh, difficult thing uh, to, uh, to put in a, in a rule book so everyone understands it in the same way, especially in the same way. Um, someone asked also about preparation. Uh, you two, obviously, at the level you referee, will be refereeing teams you're familiar with. But can you talk a bit about, do you examine teams before and look at their passive play tendencies? De definitely. It's a part of a preparation because um, in the last rule change, we had uh, the possibility to play uh, seven against six. And um, I think it may, when the teams are using the, this, we have to definitely to be more aware about uh, passive behavior because the game is getting more uh, static uh, because the playmaker, he usually tries to find an open space for the back players or for the line players or for the pivot players. And in that case, it will be um, much fewer passes than when the teams are playing six against six. So this is actually a big part of the preparation. If we know that we have teams which is changing uh, the goalkeeper for a, a field player, uh, more or less in every attack. But in general, this is just a part of the preparation that we know that uh, we showed a clip before with the, was it Brian or... Uh, uh, we showed a clip before where, where of course, we, when we have seen them throughout a tournament and they are having the same behavior, we have to be aware of that because otherwise they will be more clever than the referees. <laughs> and that's not, that's not the best part when the, the, when the teams are, are more clever than us. <laughs> all right. I think that's all for now. Can you go on if you like? Yep. Um, in this clip, uh, now it's not one pass, it's, it's two, two passes. passes. <laughs> uh, 
and when we have the passive sign, uh, the main point is the substitution that the pink team is going to make. Yeah, and just look for the forewarning signal. Because there. Yeah, um, as you can see, the again at uh, that uh, the four one city was not at the right time. I think I'll run yeah, the I'll, I'll, I think I'll run yeah. the clip again. It's better. As uh, we mentioned before, it comes in the same second as the uh, take the the nine meter, and that's what we said earlier. It's not a good uh, time to do it. No, it has to it has to come earlier. Yeah, or it has to come later. Yeah, at least three passes after. Because now they get the free throw, yeah. and uh, and direct after the free the free throw, the forewarning signal is showed. Yeah, and you can see the players running out, and then the forewarning signal comes, and there the back player, she didn't do anything. So maybe uh, she was uh, the back player, uh, right back player was disturbed uh, by her own people player who was running uh, through her, and she did. I don't know if she didn't notice. The passive play, um, but concerning uh, the timing in the passive play, it's also uh, it, it's a great importance that we do it in the correct way and and in the in the right moment, because otherwise the teams they don't understand it. No. We we when we when we have the feeling that we didn't show the the forewarning signal in the right moment, we will have a lot of arguing. Because the teams they would say that yeah, but we just we were just awarded a, a correct free throw, and now we don't get the time to uh, to, to build up. So uh, it's much much uh, better to have it before the free throw. It's not easy, but it's better to have it before the free throw, or at least as Martin said, three or four passes after the free throw. Uh, this is the conclusion for yeah. the clip. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, we go on for the next one. Um, and here we have once again we have a situation where it's possible to whistle earlier yeah. after the forewarning signal. Yeah. We hope you can focus, even though uh, the orange floor is, yeah, is not the, the best, and the orange referees. And once again, uh, keep notice about uh, the forewarning signal when it's coming. And you can see they have not. Maybe we should turn on again uh, because uh, what our topic is here that when they have um, under um, slow build up phase, phase, first of all, and when they have the passive sign, they didn't uh, speed up uh, the game uh, and they just search for a normal free throw where actually more the attacking player came to the defense player. Now we have yeah. the four warning signal. And you can see now here. No, not here. Uh, next one. This player there. They really don't want to have a free throw. This is just, uh, you can say in a hard way that the attacking player is searching for the defense player. So here, in our opinion, it should be a passive play. And once again, we can say that the, the defense is doing a perfect job. Yeah. Uh, they are not uh, playing violent or anything. They are just doing a, a good defense. Um, so just to conclude, once again, um, the attacking team is not really searching for a, 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 to score a goal, uh, but just to get a free throw. And once again, good defending. All right, uh, we go for the next one. Yeah. Well, we have one was too early. 
In our opinion, yeah, we yeah. will also conclude after the clip. But in our opinion, in this case, uh, the passive play is is made too early. Yeah. And you can even see that uh, the attacking team is one player more than the defending team. Uh, maybe we should run it again. Because in this case, uh, the forewarning signal is, is okay. Yeah, yeah, because we didn't see all the attack. No, uh, they have played before yeah. uh, the video starts. But in this case, this is a this is a build up, yeah. and uh, and in in our opinion, this is too fast. I also have to make a comment. Maybe we can run it again. Yeah, I can run it again. Also, have look at the time for the suspended uh, blue player. When the referees they raise the hand, it is fifteen seconds after uh, the suspension. Uh, it's I I cannot say it's impossible, but it's difficult to play a passive play within fifteen seconds. So, in general, we should wait longer before the. Uh, um, Forewarning signal and never in and should never call a passive play after one uh, pass after the forewarning signal here. No, but you can also say that uh, they didn't get the time to do a proper build up phase before warning signal no, no. and after the forewarning yeah, signal. Yeah. Um, so our our remark is just to let them do some more <laughs> yeah, passes. Yeah. Both and both before uh, the pa uh, forewarning signal and also after the forewarning signal. So, Courtney, do we have uh, more comments? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, someone has just asked if you can elaborate a little more about calling passive play after one pass. Mm -hmm. If you can talk a bit more about yeah, these situations. Uh, but but I, I think the main uh, focus is that uh, the number of passes doesn't really matter. No. Because it can be after one, as we showed, it could be after three or five, or it could be after six. 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 Um, the main topic is to look at the behavior. Mm -hmm. And uh, if the behavior, uh, first of all, is changing from tactical reasons, we have to be very aware. And if the behavior is changing, uh, so suddenly they don't want to search for goal chance. Yeah. As these examples where we also have given, we have given from one, uh, that where the referees have given from one passes up to five or six, yeah. and in all uh, in in all cases where we think it was a good idea, also we showed something was bad, but we have shown some good uh, calls both from one, three, and four, five uh, passes. So it doesn't really matter about how many passes we have uh, after the four one signal. It only matters about the behavior from the attacking team. Yeah, and we can also. I think we can also conclude that in most of the clips, uh, we have one player just bouncing the ball. Yeah. Um, so I think you should be aware that when one player gets the ball just bouncing to find a teammate to pass the ball to, we should definitely focus about not using six passes. Yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, we showed one clip yeah. where there are two clips yeah, where, two where the player were just bouncing. Uh, that's someone else asked about that also. If if you've shown the full warning signal and then a player is bouncing the ball, I think there's some gray area here because a player can run while bouncing the ball. So uh, yeah, but, talk if, a bit but if the player is standing and just bouncing the ball three or four times, uh, we don't think this is a change of speed and uh, going mm -hmm. for the uh, open space. No, but but Courtney, you're right. Yeah. You, you can definitely not conclude on and saying that if the play is bouncing, no. you should uh, you should turn the play. But as Martin said, if this is static and the player yeah. is just bouncing, standing, bouncing, you should definitely keep an eye on it. It could be a sign that uh, they just want to, to take time off the clock. 
So are you looking for, once you show the forewarning signal, you want to see a change in behavior? Yeah, because when, when, when yeah, exactly. Because when the forewarning signal is showed, this is um, a warning to the teams that the referees, they think they play without mm -hmm. searching for the goal. Yeah, they have to change. So they have to change behavior. And, okay. and uh, honestly, if they don't change behavior within six passes, <laughs> from one to six passes, we are uh, in our right to yeah. turn the play. Or maybe mm -hmm. even more uh, yeah. passive. Yeah. And, and I know maybe this is a bit technical and it's a bit from the refereeing side, but as we showed earlier in our presentation, this can lead to a lot of problems for everybody, especially us. And what we want is to avoid problems. So mm -hmm. when, we, when we go to five or six passes, uh, first of all, it will be um, there will be a lot of arguing about how many passes they have used. Uh, I think Martin and I we can give a lot of examples where the players they think they have used two passes and they have used five. Um, so uh, about the counting, it's also bringing in a problem. And if you come to five or six passes and you have free throw over and over again, this will just make our life much more difficult. Right. So um, they need to change behavior. Mm -hmm. um, someone asked about the understanding on the part of coaches and referees and what you've just talked about um, kind of agrees, kind of brings me to that point is um, it, it seems like it, it can be difficult to be on the same page. Uh, like you just said, the players might think they've used two passes and you count five. Can you talk a bit about this, how you can be certain as the referee? Uh, in, in most of the cases, when we have the forewarning signal, the players ask how many passes uh, do they used so far. Mm -hmm. uh, but we never answer that question. We always answer the question, how many passes they have used. No, no, no. Yeah, they, exact, they, they, exact. They always ask how many they have left. Yes, exact. And we always okay. tell them how many they have used. Because, you know, if we said you have two left or four left and we uh, call a passive play after two uh, passes and say, are you a jerk? Can you, can, can you count to two or four? Uh, so right. we always tell them that you have used two and not uh, you have four left. Uh, just to turn a little bit around. Uh, and we do it so both the attacking team can uh, uh, hear and also the defending team. So everyone has the same, the same uh, criteria to, for the next uh, few uh, passes. But honestly, Courtney, the reason why everybody is asking about, uh, asking us about the number of passes is that everybody is expecting that they have six passes. And, and uh, in general, that's a problem because uh, that's the reason why we have to be very certain about um, not telling how many passes they have left, but telling how many they have used, because otherwise we, we, we never have the, have the chance to turn the play um, before six passes. Um, uh, I think we can continue, and if we have some time, I have some more general questions that maybe yeah. we can address. Uh, I think it's uh, yeah. concerning the time. I think it's okay, yeah, because we, yeah. what is it, 15 yeah, minutes we left? Are, and we almost to it. Yeah. Okay, um, here we have a call for passive play after, uh, after free passes. Yeah, it's a picture in picture, but uh, I think everybody can see it anyway. Should we run it again? Yeah. Uh, let me make a comment on it. Um, uh, the time for the forewarning signal is uh, quite okay, uh, but it was a quite tough call because the left back was about to uh, to go up and make a shoot. So I think uh, here, even though that they were playing backwards, uh, I think it was too tough to call uh, the passive play because she had a good chance for the next two uh, 
to take a shot on goal. You can say that uh, after the third pass, yeah. uh, the back is coming yeah. and she is in speed yeah. and she has actually a, a possibility to to rise up and shoot. Yeah, even though that the playmaker, uh, the right back plays it a little bit backwards. Exactly. Yeah. But, but once again, I think this clip shows why it's a problem yeah. <laughs> and why it's very hard. Because this was in, in the certain game, now this was one of our own games, but in this certain game, we had the feeling that uh, now it was not a good change in behavior. And sometimes we do it too fast. Yeah. So this is also dangerous if, if suddenly, if you, if you only look for having passive play before six passes. Yeah. yeah. It's a tough call. We always we always call it a tough call when we don't know what's right or what's wrong, uh, and and maybe that's um, uh, honestly it's it's saying uh, everything about passive play rule that uh, sometimes it's a tough call and sometimes Martin and I we can see it in one way, maybe we are not even uh, agreeing inside our own couple, and and sometimes um, everybody else sees it uh, in in another way. So it's it's really really problematic. Um, okay, we have one more clip where the referees, they are using uh, the possibility to, to referee be, or to whistle before uh, three passes or six passes. And I think once, once again, we should focus on a slowly, slowly build up phase. And also the bouncing of, uh, of the player who doesn't move. Yeah. Should we maybe run it once more? Yeah, first of all, uh, before the forewarning signal, focus on the quite slow build up phase, uh, good defense. And no real effort to make an open space? No. And you can see it's only. one attacking player who's moving at the time. Yeah. So here we think it's a, it's a good opportunity because of the good defense and because of the lack of movement from the attacking team. Yeah, and they are actually, uh, because the defending team is moving very actively, yeah. uh, the attacking team, they are actually losing the possibility to go through or to find an open space. Yeah. So it's good defense. Yeah. Actually, um, these two little guys, they, uh, they show that we came to an end with our presentation. So we are, um, we are more than ready to, uh, to answer more questions, Courtney, if you, if you got more questions. Yes, we do. Okay, so first of all, some people would like some more clarification about showing the signal in the cases where you show it after just one or two passes. I don't think this happens often. So maybe you can give some examples why this would happen, why you would call, why you would show the signal so early. Why we should uh, show the forewarning signal. Yes, after just you showed some example where someone did one pass and then the forewarning signal is shown. Okay, but then maybe. Why was... does this happen sometimes? Okay, but then was maybe uh, that uh, we showed the, no, you mean after a free throw or something like that? Or yes. because, yeah, okay. Um, I think when the referees raise the hand for the foreman signal after one or two passes after the free throw, I think it is because they have speaking just before the free throw that now we can have a passive, a lot of forewarning signal. And then they said, oh shit, uh, now we have a, for, a free throw and we have to remember that it was passive play. So immediately when the when the ball is free again, we raise the hand. I think this is what we are thinking. Yeah, but actually, it's it's uh, after every throw, right? Yeah. It's it's also, for instance, after a team timeout. Yeah. Uh, you you, <laughs> if you have the feeling that uh, that there is some passive behavior before team timeout, of course we have to remember that after the team timeout. But we also have to be aware that they need to have a certain amount of passes before we raise the the for the forewarning signal. 
because otherwise, as a uh, as an attacking team, you have no chance to <laughs> to go for uh, uh, to go for the goal. Yes. Um, okay. And some other people are asking, how do you take the strong defense into account? Because we're mainly looking at attack, um, but of course there can be times that a team might look more passive just because they're struggling to break through or something. So how do you adjust for this? Um, I think um, because if you have a strong uh, a physical or bad defense, then I think we don't have the problem by the uh, not referring before the six passes. Mm -hmm. I think this will come in the presentation of Bjarne tomorrow because uh, there we have the unfair, the, the tough playing defense. And I think he will show some examples where if the, the defense was acting in a fair way, maybe we could call a passive play before. Yeah, and it's, of course, Courtney, it's very important to say that um, that, that it has to be a fair defense. Yeah. Because uh, if it's not a fair defense, uh, in that case, the referees, they have the chance to, to punish. And in that case, uh, the, the attacking team, they will get the ball again and they will have a new build-up phase. So if the referees are skilled enough, they should uh, they should be aware of this. So, and that, that's why uh, this specific point is not in our presentation because our presentation was uh, mainly in uh, uh, bef uh, re referring before uh, six passes. Um, but I, I think people are more asking if it is a fair defense, um, if it is just a much stronger defense than the attacking team. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the attacking team can't be punished for passive play, surely, as you, okay, you must but, take into this yeah. into account a bit. But 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 the question makes sense that if you have a, uh, you can say you have a more physical superior team uh, defending. In that case, it would be more difficult for the attacking team to break through. Mm. Yeah, that's right. But uh, but honestly, that's just handball, right? Yeah, because that, the, the the best defense is. Best attack maybe. yeah yeah and yeah exactly the best defense could be the best attack but but in that case as long as they stay within the the playing routes yeah. as long as they defend like they should defend um it's not the it's not the fault of the defense that the attacking team is playing passively so so a good defense just uh, i think leads to more uh, forewarning signals yeah. Yeah, so that, that's what I mean. It's just if the attacking team are trying their hardest to score, yeah. but they are outmatched by the defense, then you can't call. It seems that you shouldn't be calling passive play as early for these kinds of teams. It's a more the question for a, an attacking side. And yeah, but if they're just having trouble to get through. But the, the question makes sense. But uh, on the other hand, I think our our answer is that if the defender is doing their their job, if they're better than the attack, then I think it's uh, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. I, I'm not asking about punishing the defenders. It's about punishing the attacking mm -hmm. team yeah. uh, in this way. If they're, but uh, yeah. Okay. So. Um, some people also ask about stopping the clock in the last minute when it's very close and if something happens that a player is delaying starting. Um, yeah. Can you talk a bit about this? Do uh, you would stop be, the would clock be more frequently? To have this <laughs> four four o'clock? <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but honestly, I think every referee is sometimes doing timeouts they regret. Yeah, but in principle, uh, we should use the timeout in the same way yeah. that in the first minute, like we do in the last minute. Yeah. But we also have to admit that the players are also reacting in a bit different in the sec last minute than they do in the first minute. Mm -hmm. But we have to use the same criteria. Yeah. And I know it's a little bit yeah, blah, blah, but um, we have to be aware when the teams are using the time and just look at the watch. But we also have still say that use the timeout in the first minute like in the last minute i think we uh, yeah I, I think as martin said this is very it's very difficult to answer but i think we have to be very direct in our answer is that we have to apply the same rules in the first minute as in the last minute 
And, uh, then, and then note that the players can also erect in a different way. For sure, if the players, they, if they change their behavior, in that case, we should also change our behavior. But uh, one more comment about team time, or not team time, but about using the timeout. Um, we have had some situations where we made timeout uh, two seconds or one second before the end. And this is definitely not good. Because as everybody know, you have three seconds right in the end to uh, to make a shoot or whatever to start a, a throw, and in that case, it's only leading to problems if we uh, if we stop the time within the last two or three seconds. Um, I think this would be quite a rare situation, but someone has asked about when to call passive play if a team is spending a long time substituting or doing, we do see this sometimes if there's disorganized substitutions and it takes a long time. The most, um, the most typical example there is uh, when teams are using two uh, substitution uh, from uh, going from defense to attack and then they're just uh, used it in two different ways by running up all six uh, players and then first they change one player and then they're playing five seconds more and then play uh, change the second player. Mm. And that is uh, something that we have noticed that uh, if they do that, uh, we can raise the hand there yeah, uh, for sure. uh, when they do the second uh, substitution. And it's okay, it's okay if they do it in the same time and quickly, but it's not okay if they uh, do the first uh, substitution and then play some more seconds and play the second substitution. And uh, I think we all have the feeling when it's used in a tactical matter as well, because we can see that sometimes uh, there is a certain change in behavior than when they play with one player less. Uh, and in that case, we have to be very careful about how they are using the substitutions to take time of the clock. Um. Okay, I think we have time for one more. And um, a few people have asked about specific attacking situations where you might call direct passive play. And I, so I just asked you about these situations. Someone asked about a fast break. If someone is on a fast break and then passes back to their teammate. Um, or someone asked if, if there's a lot of, sometimes they've seen passive play called if there are a lot of uh, a Kemper attempt, multiple Kemper passes. So people are asking about these specific situations. And I, I do you have a clear rule for that helps you differentiate when you think a clear scoring chance is not being yeah, used yeah. properly? I, I can, I'll try to make it as clear as I can. If a player uh, have the possibility to have a chance and he deliver the ball to a player who's not have uh, who have a more bad position than he has mm -hmm. himself mm -hmm. then it's direct passive play it's okay to make a camper if the player who received the ball have a better opportunity to score a goal than the player who who, who left the ball mm -hmm. definitely and and we also have to be aware that the camper now is not spectacular anymore no, no. Uh, because they the best teams in the world they use this as just a normal system yeah. and uh, and in that case the, the campus should never be in my opinion it should never be handled as a passive behavior no. um, but as Martin said before if you if you are in a clear chance of scoring and and you you pass the ball to a, a, a teammate who has a not as good chance as as the one who passed the ball, it, it should direct be direct passive play. But it's still allowed if the if there are counter attack and the wing player delivered to a center player who is in front of him is no problem. Of course, of course. So the conclusion basically is uh, that um, it's all it's often about the behavior and just really judging each individual situation. Yeah. Yeah. It. it but. But it's. Courtney, that's the reason why this is hard to conclude on. And, mm. and of course, we knew before we started the presentation that um, in some areas, it's very hard to be objective. Yeah. Uh, we have tried to be as objective as possible, and we have tried to 
to come up with some clips where we are as objective as possible. <laughs> but we know that this is open for discussion. And, uh, and I'm quite sure that uh, Ramon and uh, Dietrich and the other good people in the IHF, they are really trying to, to solve this challenge uh, to make passive play even more understandable than it is today. And maybe make it more objective than subjective. Yeah, because uh, as every uh, rule in the, in the rule book, the more objective and the less uh, each referee, each coach, each spectator, uh, has to decide, the easier our game is to understand. And I think we have uh, some certain areas and passive play is one of them where sometimes it's very hard for uh, people outside the, the sport to understand what's going on. Okay, um, I think we'll have to leave this there. That's the end of our, our time for today. Uh, thank you very much, Mass and Martin. I hope everyone learned a lot from this presentation, but this topic is going to be addressed in, first, in more detail tomorrow in the second lecture of the afternoon at three o'clock Central European Summertime with Bjarne Jensen, a member of the IHF Playing Rules and Referees Commission. Uh, later in the next lecture this afternoon at three o'clock Central European Summertime, we have a uh, coaching Focus presented by Jorge Duenas, IHF Commission for Coaching and Methods member and current coach of the Brazil Women's Handball Team. Uh, and that's coming up next at three o'clock. And yes, so that's all for today. So now, thank you very much, Master Martin. You're welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm.